Minecraft is the highest selling video game of all time, and it's not even close. What was once a sketchy EXE file that got passed around on image boards has now become one of the most popular games in the modern era, and that's pretty wild. Listen, I'm just saying, once you've broken into the Spirit Halloween level of mainstream, you've made it. The concept is incredibly simple. You've got an open world, do whatever you want. You can build, you can mine, you can destroy, you can run off into the distance, make a cabin, log off, and never come back. This virtual sand Box has grown so much and continue to have support for well over a decade now, so it's no wonder kids were and are still crazy about this thing. And adults too, apparently. Tell your friends you about a month on a dedicated server and they all start showing up. If you build it, they will come. Minecraft has had a lot of growing pains, but the one thing that doesn't get talked about much these days are the clones. The ripoffs, the open source ports, the things very clearly inspired by Minecraft. I mean, this thing essentially helped to shape an entire genre. The the open world survival games that to this day are extremely popular. I think it's pretty obvious that you probably wouldn't have something like Valheim or Ark if Steve Minecraft hadn't paved the way. We're gonna be looking at a few different examples of Minecraft clones today. We've got ones quite literally ripping it off. We've got games that might function a little differently but also look like they might have just been a mod. And lastly, the ones to draw heavy inspiration from it. Let's just say if your game looks like this, it probably counts. Where am I? I am so hungry. So thirsty. Oh, I can't believe it. I'm surrounded by water. Something important to point out real quick though is the existence of a smaller indie, Infiniminer. This little block building and destruction game made by the guy who'd go on to form Zactronics is often looked at to be one of Minecraft's inspirations. There's a lot of what ifs on what could have been with this, but only Minecraft has unofficial isekai novels sitting around in convenience stores. So yo, it's Austin, and today we're gonna be throwing open the gates to explore the new randomly generated world of Minecraft clones. If you go all the way back to its first early betas, Minecraft is nearly 14 years old, which is crazy. And since its release, we've seen a ton of games come out that are clearly inspired by, or just straight up ripping it off. I hope you like voxels. There's lots of sprites, squares, cubes, and other things to smash together. But before we get started, this video has been brought to you by manscaped.com for when you need to attend to those rounder surfaces. Gamers are a patchy folk. I'm sure a lot of y'all, myself included, could stand to take better care of your facial hair and stop being a, well, literal neck beard. Hmm, well, stop it. Hocking away with a regular razor is no good. You need to be using Manscaped's Beard Hedger Pro Kit. This thing's got a 7200 RPM motor with a titanium coated T-blade that'll cut through the thickest of hair while also being really easy on the skin. It's waterproof, cordless, and rechargeable, so you can knock out all sorts of body hair in the shower. No more being plugged into the wall or having to worry about low quality razors. I like to keep things nice and tight myself, but there's 20 different lengths on the zoom wheel for you to experiment with and give yourself a nice new look. The Pro Kit comes with beard oil, beard shampoo, and and beer conditioner, all of which is cruelty-free, sulfate-free, dye-free, and vegan. So feel free to lather up and embrace being a well-groomed gamer. It also comes with a nice little carrying case so you can take care of yourself on the go, and you'll get yourself a free little gift with handy accessories. It's a pretty good deal. So if you wanna up your facial hair game, go to manscaped.com today and get 20% off and free international shipping when you use my code eruption at checkout. That's code eruption for 20% off. Thanks so much to Manscaped for the sponsor, but for now, it's time to lose these rounded features and embrace the block. After Minecraft exploded in popularity in the 2010s, a ton of clones began to come out of nowhere. Anyone with an Xbox 360 and access to the live knows exactly what I'm talking about. Prior to Mojang releasing this thing on consoles, heck, prior to the game properly releasing 1.0, this console was filled with ripoffs. It's weird to think that Minecraft was the first real early access game, launching as a paid product before it was anywhere near done. Heck, the thing sold over 4 million copies before properly hitting that 1.0, which is ridiculous to think about. The virality of Minecraft was off the charts, and it wouldn't be an exaggeration to say that there were hundreds of people trying to replicate it. If you just look at open source ports, homebrews, and random people trying to hop on the trend, you can spend an entire day browsing these things. Manic Digger, Uber Blocks, Mine Builder, Builder, Craft World, the list goes on and on. A majority of these are unfinished projects, and some of them even received cease and desist from Mojang. Generally, these super early direct clones aren't too terribly interesting to talk about. Mindblock 2D on Java, DS Craft on the DSi, yeah, sure, they exist. I mean, most of them just look like they could be texture packs for the main game, and a lot of them fall behind mechanically, which I guess is what happens when you have several million dollars in the bank. However, a majority of these were on PC, so how about the console? 
consoles. Minecraft didn't officially hit Xbox 360 until May 2012, so thanks to the power of the now-defunct self-publishing Xbox Live Indie Games label, a few notable clones would make their way into the living rooms. And I don't blame them for trying. At that time, Minecraft had yet to be announced for anything but PC, so they were filling in a niche. I mean, for a lot of people, these were their formative Minecraft years. It's all they were able to play. The first of the bunch was Fortress Craft, a game that claimed it wasn't a Minecraft clone. Yeah, okay. However, it does have the major difference of not having a survival mode. This was basically creative shoved into a neat little package. There were a few game types and patches added over time, but the main shtick was being able to make big stuff together with your friends. And you play as your Xbox avatar. Sick. This apparently sold over 750,000 copies too, which goes to show there was a demand. And if for some reason you feel like playing it, there's actually a version of this on Steam now. Then you had Total Miner Forge doing the survival crafty miney thing. This one was about as close to its source material as possible. It actually had blueprints built into the world and game to teach you recipes, so you didn't have to spend time looking on a wiki. One glance at this thing, you might actually think it's a slightly modded version of Minecraft. I do, however, like the depth map. Thing was handy for finding certain minerals. Total Miner was pretty solid for, well, let's face it, basically a direct recreation of Minecraft. Castle Miner was another big release, and this one pulled a lot more from Fortress Craft with its lack of a survival mode. Simply, go make stuff. This time with avatars. Over 200 blocks. These Xbox Live Indie games were typically very bare bones on features, which makes sense considering they usually cost less than five bucks. However, Castle Miner released on July 27th, 2011, a few weeks after Mojang officially announced at E3 that they'd be bringing their big boy to the Xbox 360, meaning the market for these micro clones was about to up and vanish. This, of course, left Castle Miner developer Digital DNA Games with one final option, something that would end up selling over 900,000 units and becoming the best-selling Xbox Live indie game of all time. What happens when you combine Minecraft with the then quickly growing but not quite oversaturated yet zombie genre? Well, you get Castle Miner Z. Let's go. Those who know, know. The Xbox Live Indie Games program was shut down and everything delisted back in 2017, so unfortunately I can't show off my chunky Xbox avatar. But it did get a release on Steam where you can pick up a four pack for $8, so I went ahead and cursed a few friends of mine. Castle Miner Z is simply a combination Minecraft, Call of Duty Zombies, Taco Bell type of deal. It's also a reminder of how powerful nostalgia is. It lacks a few things to source material and even the clones have. Water's not a thing, building is extremely bare bones and done through a tiny menu. You also have endless zombies and occasionally dragons trying to kill you. There's several modes here. You've got creative, so you can build little contraptions to try and defend yourself from the creatures of the night, but being honest, it's all quite a bit lackluster. But at $2, this thing was hitting a very specific niche market and hitting it well. Specifically the kids and tweens too young for Call of Duty who also couldn't play Minecraft. I love the fact that your Xbox 360 avatars are used on the console version they look so goofy running around with big guns and giant pickaxes. Steam obviously doesn't have that, so instead you've got yourself a generic military man, or uh, for them showing off bullets, or doing whatever this is. There's a bunch of tools and guns to collect and craft with higher numbers depending on the minerals you find, but it's all just skirting the surface in depth. There are random boxes of loot which do help with the zombie thing, but it's kind of just this. Not that I was expecting to have my tits blown off by Castle Miner Z, but still. Apparently by the end of its lifespan, it sold over one and a half million copies, along with the original Passing a Mill, so it just goes to show that being an opportunist sometimes pays off. I wouldn't be surprised if we start seeing video essays from kids called Castle Miner Z was better than Minecraft in the next five years. Nowadays, the zombie genre of games has calmed down quite a bit from the initial craze, but time's a flat circle, and I could really do with a new craft zombie game right about now. It's really too bad that there aren't any other like crafting zombie survival games to talk about. <laughs> We'll come back to zombies again, I'm sure, but I think it's really important to look at Minecraft's more direct influences. This can go one of two ways. There's the survival crafting genre, which would really begin to take off over the next few years, but like more directly, you would start to see a lot more things using voxels. And that makes sense. The 3D voxel was by no means a new thing, but you definitely saw a lot more of these coming out after Minecraft. The first video game to use this visual style was a little DOS thing called Comanche Maximum Overkill. Vox 
Voxels distilled down to their most basic concept are 3D pixel cubes on a grid that's viewable in a three-dimensional space. There's a lot that goes into this, but it's essentially a way of viewing 3D graphics. There's a lot of games out there using them that you'd probably never notice either. So yeah, it may not be the first, but it would be dishonest to say that Minecraft wasn't responsible for the massive uptick in video games throwing perfect cubes at me. And in the early 2010s, there were a lot, like Ace of Spades. It combined the building sandbox and mining of Mojang's big hit, but with one kicker, Team Deathmatch. Oh, and guns. This was originally released as a small prototype alpha that made waves on various message boards and got a lot of notoriety. While the building aspects were extremely minimal, it was definitely cool to be digging and creating your own trenches and forts in a first person shooter setting. It reminded me a lot of Tribes 2's construction mode, but a little more grounded. The pace slower, the feeling of a battle taking shape over a good amount of time. It needed teamwork and strategy, something a lot of shooters in that era didn't have. The problem is that this unfinished base was so well received that you know some bigger corporation was gonna try and do a little acquiring. And who better than Jagex, the developer of RuneScape? Yes, buying GF RuneScape. So what happened was, this little free thing with a half a million monthly players was left unfinished in favor of a brand new title costing $10 that said, what if we go full on twitchy shooter? And that was that. I think the original being free helped it a lot, but audiences sorely rejected this new Jagex version of Ace of Spades, and it pretty quickly found itself without a player base. On top of that, Jagex went ahead and released another game that was very similar, Block and Load. It's not even just the concept, even the logo is basically the same. The free to play Block and Load was received a bit better, even if it was just a shinier version of the bastardization of Ace of Spades. Though it seems, no matter how far we get from Minecraft, you're still not going to be able to escape those blocky trees. There's a Block and Load 2 coming out too, but unfortunately, Ace of Spades was shut down in 2019 as that original audience just didn't gel with it. However, it seems like guns, crafting, and cubes are a match made in heaven, as we're seeing a lot of these. Like Guncraft, a game with a huge player base. Guncraft is one of those countless blocky shooty things that would come out in the early 2010s, and it had some pretty decent ideas. You shoot stuff, you build stuff, and try to survive blocky modern warfare. The character models look like Chad versions of Minecraft Steve. Really, this whole thing looks like something I'd conjure up while disassociating. It had a small cult player base for a bit, and you'd think they'd stop selling this thing considering you can't properly play it anymore so servers are offline, but no, you can still buy it. Same with Murder Miners, the number one rated Xbox Live indie game, according to who, I'm not sure, but the developer sure just wanted to mash Halo and Minecraft together. Some of the quotes in the official trailer are hilarious, like, Murder Miners is the savior of the FPS genre. Big words for a game with a $5 four pack. This one actually isn't terrible, like, you'd never play this over over hundreds of other FPSs, but it feels competent enough to have fun with friends for a few rounds. The best part is building a map in multiplayer and then immediately playing some deathmatch on it, even if the map totally sucks and you keep spawning off the edge. That's my fault though. I'm still not really sure why this whole shooter Minecraft combination of things was so popular in quotations for a while, and I don't think the voxel gun love story is gonna end anytime soon. Though nowadays it seems like we're leaning more into the Counter-Strike Roblox fusion babies with Krunker. How about Cube World Survival? a hit Steam release that literally won't come up with anything for me on YouTube. Look, if you search up the tag Voxel on Steam, you're gonna find endless things like this. I'm not gonna sit here and say that every game with guns and voxels is a Minecraft clone, because it definitely isn't. <laughs> However, you can't convince me that they weren't trying to do that for a very specific reason. Step away from those masterpieces, let's tone it down a bit. Now, Big 3D blocks and voxels aren't gonna be just restricted to blasting and crafting. We would also go underground, like really deep underground with something like Eldritch. I remember Eldritch coming out and buying it day one because the concept alone was cool to me. It's a roguelike dungeon crawler with a Lovecraftian twist. It also looked extremely similar to that signature Minecraft style, and in 2013, that wasn't very common outside of the sandbox experiences. I mean, if I see a picture of you holding a pickaxe, looking at cubes that you can hit with the pickaxe, you're just telling on yourself. This thing was cool though. I'm not much of a horror guy, as some of y'all know, but for some reason I can handle the Lovecraft side of things. And to be fair, putting these crazy looking fishmen in a setting like this 
this really tones down the spookiness. You go level to level getting weapons, powers, and dungeon diving in order to find relics to find your way out of the nightmare world. It's not too terribly long, but for a little PC indie, it has a lot to like. Also, some of these block textures are so close, it's not even funny. At a certain point, Minecraft looking games really became a choose your own adventure type of thing. No matter the setting, you could find yourself doing some mining, crafting, and in some cases, fighting dragons. You could go medieval with block story, which still to this day has a small running community, or take it above the atmosphere into uncharted space with Xeno Miner. There's even the 3DS exclusive Cube Creator 3D, which actually came out several years before the official Mojang port. You'd be totally forgiven and mistaking this one for the official release. Unfortunately, a lot of these are no longer available due to the eShop and the 360 Xbox Live Indie Game Store getting shut down and delisted. You know, the 2020 problems. Speaking of totally mistaking a game for another, have you ever wondered what Minecraft would be like if it went like full in on the survival mechanics? Well, you'd get something called Vintage Story, a game that looks very similar to Minecraft. Which makes sense considering it has roots as a Minecraft mod called Vintage Craft. Vintage Story takes everything you know about that survival mode and pumps it up to 11. You enter this world and have to get to building your first shelter and hunting food, but this thing has a much harder start. In Minecraft, you'd punch a tree, make some sticks, and have yourself a mini fort in five minutes. Vintage Story has you literally grabbing loose stones to then start napping off the edges to create tools. Firewood only lasts a short amount of time, the durability is a lot harsher, Sure. It's what I think a lot of people wanted the survival mode in Minecraft to be, but it never really became. You also have to battle the elements with gear to survive different seasons. The winters are harsh and cold, you can't go crops for several in-game days, and it brings a different gameplay loop to what you would expect from something like this. It leans a little closer into the modern sandbox survival games like Sons of the Forest, which I'm sure we'll talk about some of those later. But watching the voxel plants move rapidly with harsh winds was something that I didn't know I was interested in seeing. There's a lot of really small cool touches. I obviously didn't have time to get too far into a world myself for this video, but everything I've seen from other videos and heard about from friends seems incredibly engaging in a way that you don't see too often these days. For newbies, there is a guide built into the game, so you're not totally lost and forced to stare at wikis all day. But for those seeking a greater challenge than basic survival mode, Vintage Story really hits that itch. I just hope they don't add Far Cry 2 malaria mechanics. Now, Vintage Story might kind of look like it, but what about the games that are actively trying to trick you into thinking you're playing with Minecraft Steve? Anyone who's ever browsed the mobile app stores knows exactly what I'm talking about. Multicraft Build and Mine, Blockcraft 3D Building Game, Craft Earth Boy, Worldcraft Block Craftsman, HD Craft 3D Ultra Realistic G, developed by a company called Bad Review Games, which kind of says it all. I literally can't find the end of the straight up ripoffs on the app stores, so we're not gonna get too much into it. But prior to Minecraft getting its proper 699 mobile version, these things were popping up everywhere. It looks like Minecraft Dungeons got clones now too. I mean, look at Blockman Go. Yo, this is just a freaking treasure trove of copyright infringement. Oh my God. Anyways, let's talk about a game that was once upon a time, one of the rare Wii U exclusives. Cube Life Island Survival. Sure, it's not as sought after as like Twilight Princess HD, but unlike that, it does feature full voice acting. It's a chip in there, good source for food. If I combine two sticks and three planks, I could create a pickaxe. Select coconut and press the key to drink. Yes, yes, this is real. Cube Life Island Survival is frankly bizarre. It got a PC port a few years back and it's a strange attempt at combining Minecraft with Lost. You start the game shipwrecked and have to do the survival thing on an island living your life amongst the cubes. This thing really looks like someone made a Minecraft and Unreal 5 4K type of video, except it's real. And as I'm sure you can parse, not very good. Resource grinding might be a big part of this entire genre, but Cube Life takes that to another level. For example, in order to just make a bed, you need a blanket, a pillow, and a mattress. Each of those requires several pieces of stuffed leather, which require several more pieces of boar leather. So just to sleep, you're gonna need 11 stuffed leather, which is 33 boar leather, plus an additional four for the pillow. You start off on this tiny island, and boars don't drop leather 100% of the time, so yeah, I stopped playing because that's stupid. Enjoy running around at night when it's so dark you can barely see anything. But at least it did give us this. I must drink something as soon as possible. Uh. 
Maybe they break open some coconuts over there. Look, there's a lot of these little indies made just trying to make a quick buck and I can't blame them. But I think I want to move on because first off, we would be here all day and I'd run out of things to say. So let's move on to something a bit more interesting. With Minecraft came early access and Kickstarter and with both of those came big public stinky failures like Yogg Ventures. <laughs> now that's a spicy one. Yogg Ventures was a Kickstarter project helmed by popular YouTube channel Yogg's Cast that had the misfortune of being one of the poster children for failed projects. Next to Project Phoenix, of course. <laughs> I'm still waiting. Yogg Ventures wanted to expand on the crafting and mining experience that Minecraft had and take things to another level of visual fidelity and, well, offer adventures. Whatever that means. There's a huge story here and others have compiled it way better than I could in a video like this, but essentially they brought on a small developer called Wintercool Games who ran out of the Kickstarter money. The project kind of fizzled out over time, the developer shut it down, and that'd be that. Yogscast did offer keys to another Kickstarter project named Tug, which is now also no longer available, so it just all seems like a huge mess that everyone's trying to distance themselves from. Which, I mean, yeah, that's totally fair. This probably didn't help. Next up, Cube World. No, not Cube World Survival, simply Cube World. Less of a direct Minecraft clone and more of a combination of its style with something like The Legend of Zelda or MMOs like World of Warcraft. Cube World was an extremely ambitious title that upon its initial alpha reveal made a bunch of waves over the internet, but kind of faded out over time before its eventual release, where it was then noticeably different and ultimately not what the players wanted. When Cube World's alpha hit the net in 2013, it kind of felt like this would be the next big thing, like you were playing an action RPG that was thrown into someone's Minecraft world. You had different classes, lots of gear, pets, tons of abilities. It was a game for people who love adventure, especially since you could play it with friends. Those initial few months created a lot of buzz, but after a DDoS attack targeted the developer's website, purchases were turned off, updates slowed down majorly, and then eventually, radio silence. The thing eventually came out in 2019, much different from its original preview, and for a lot of people, significantly worse. The final product is really strange. There's not much to guide you on what to do, and for something that wants you to fight enemies to get gear to become stronger, you're sure gonna get two shot left and right out of the gate. Cube World lacks direction, and this whole story, like Yogg Ventures, is more of a tragedy than a comedy. There is a modding scene trying to make things more playable, but Cube World's always gonna be something of a what if. A lot of voxel-based crafting and mining games have gone through the whole early access shtick to various results, so we'll keep it brief. Although I think we're all still missing out on Hytale. The fact that the reveal trailer has over 60 million views now kinda says it all. Hytale is the Half-Life 3 of Minecraft clones. This thing started similarly to Vintage Story as a Minecraft multiplayer server named Hypixel. The main difference is that that studio was then acquired by Riot Games, has a several million dollar investment, and they're taking their time to make some something that, frankly, does look pretty awesome. As of 2023, there's still no word on this being playable anytime soon, but I think we'd all rather them take their time and create something that'll make a huge impact. Or maybe the third impact. My tale. Minecraft was one of the first modern survival crafting experiences out there, and it has had a quite the impact. It's been surprisingly absent from consoles for the most part, but any PC gamer is very well aware of the open world survival crafting genre. One that is still extremely popular to this day, that's kind of like Sailor Moon with its villain of the week thing. <laughs> They're also the video game equivalent of crack like Sons of the Forest. There's nothing about this that inherently screams Minecraft clone, but so many mechanics of resource gathering, building, and survival are rooted in the cubes. There's obviously nothing with the same popularity as Mojang's behemoth at all, but there's definitely a lot of what I'm calling Minecraft alternatives. When the gaming industry realized that humans haven't evolved much from babies, and we still, in fact, love playing in the sandboxes, the gates opened up. We yearned for the mines. Bigger developers and publishers wanted in on the sweet inbooks and nothing was gonna stop them. The first I remember was a little game called Trove by Tryon Worlds, the people behind Rift and Defiance, rest in peace. I played the free-to-play Trove around its launch and thought it was neat, but fell off immediately. I mean, it's a free-to-play MMO. It has Minecraft building and crafting mechanics, but really turned for the worse over time. They leaned into the generic MMORPG thing pretty hard and it's nearly unrecognizable from launch. Now you're running around fighting monsters, doing random dungeons, 
participating in its battle royale mode and spending a very minimal amount of time assembling cubes. It's a shame. A much better example of a Minecraft alternative would be something like Creative Verse, developed by Playful Corp, the people who brought us Super Lucky's Tale. Creative Verse is, as you see on the screen, exactly what it looks like. It had a bit of a controversy as it used to be free to play, but recently swapped to a full pay to play model, removing it from people who had it already. And if you didn't pay, they were also gonna remove worlds that were already built, and so hey, that's not great. I do think that it's a very solid Minecraft clone though. You swap between the first and third person using your weapons and a lot of things have a sense of familiarity while being slightly different as well. I like how much faster you can mine. It's got a nice vibe to it, but if we're being real, I think it might be dead. This thing originally launched in early access in 2014 and then became pay to play in 2022, which is not only a bizarre decision, but it's almost a decade old. There's a few hundred daily players, but it's a far cry from its peak. It's all about those Robux now. Also, I respect y'all. I'm not gonna sit here and call Terraria a Minecraft clone, even though it's extremely similar in its gameplay structure. Just a little bit more combat. I mean, I'm old enough to remember when this thing was using Final Fantasy V sprites. It's come a long way. At a certain point, the Minecraft clone began to intersect with farming and life sims, and things really began to explode. Games like Staxel, Boundless, Lego Worlds, Seven Days to Die, and Portal Knights all definitely went to the same middle school, is all I'm saying. This goes all the way up to things published on the largest of stages with No Man's Sky. A controversial pick for sure, but one that takes the basis of something that existed before it and literally flew into space. This thing has its own legacy of becoming the comeback kit of video games, and it's still to this day getting huge updates. I mean, not even a month ago. Jeez. So what happens when you put famous, well-loved developer Arc System Works on the table? Yeah, like Guilty Gear Arc Sys. Well, you get Cube Creator X. Y'all remember that 3DS game from earlier? Well, its developer, Big John Games, decided to team up with Arxis in order to make this thing for the Switch and eventually PC. Cube Creator X is a title with zero Steam reviews that totally works on my PC. That sounds lovely. But it doesn't seem to have much better luck on the Switch, according to the official trailer, showing the frame rate getting absolutely demolished. Creator X is fine. It follows the genre tropes with little zones you can go through while collecting and crafting stuff, but also has a hub world with quests you can accept. You play as a little block dude that you can customize, the interface works well and is familiar. It was designed to be a budget title, so it's not really pushing any boundaries, like at all. In fact, the only difference from Minecraft is that it uses more rounded shapes and is less of a sandbox and more of an objective-based experience. Not bad, not great, but a decent Minecraft alternative for the kids who are painfully addicted to the concept. Jiggly, jiggly, I'm coming for a movie. It does have multiplayer, but I doubt I'll be able to get anyone to play this with me. Especially if you take a look at the user-created content section, which as of today has literally nothing in it, despite coming out several years ago with an all-time peak of three players. That is really sad and unfortunate, but it's also just the fate for a lot of these Minecraft clones, ripoffs, and alternatives. One game is just so domineering over the entire genre that it's just kind of hard to squeeze in there. But there was one big publisher who gave it a shot. Now, when you think of like AAA trend hoppers, you typically think of companies like Ubisoft, EA, but no, this time it was Square Enix. And not just one, but two different games. Look, I'm just trying to say, I don't think anyone expected Dragon Quest Builders. As it turns out, this was a fantastic idea. The original came out on PlayStation 3, 4, Vita, and Switch, while the sequel's available everywhere, and these two titles have a lot of heart. The concept is simple, the world needs a fixin'. You're a legendary builder, help rebuild the world. The original takes place in an alternate ending to the original Dragon Quest, and the sequel follows the second game. Both of these are pretty solid, but I mostly play the sequel for this video. Why? Game Pass, baby. Yeah! Builders takes the concepts of Minecraft and rolls with them in a way that is really easy to understand. Recipes are done more similarly to the modern version of crafting in these games, and gathering is usually pretty quick. I mean, you'll smack things one or two times with a stick and have new stuff in your inventory. You place blocks, build arrangements, make houses and towns, and do your best to restore the world to its former glory. But you don't just have building and crafting, we've also got leveling up and fighting. Builders kind of leans a little more into something like Dark Cloud or Act 
Act Razor at times, where you'll be responsible for pre-configs for story, as well as having the freedom to do whatever you want. But there's also waves of enemies to fight, and you'll have to beef up your village to defend themselves. Yes, you can arm your villagers, which also means boss encounters can totally destroy everything you've built. Yay. The one major differing factor is that both builders do follow a central narrative with levels. The first game literally yeets you out of an area when you've finished it, but two allows you to go back and see how things develop over time. It follows more of a traditional RPG structure while having all of those blocky crafting elements as the main mechanic. And I think it pulls it off spectacularly. Everything but the multiplayer anyways. Unfortunately, since this thing is story driven, whenever you join up with your friends, which takes like seven hours by the way, all progress is tied to the host. So, you know, it's one of those. Granted, you can have a good time running around with buds, smashing, crafting, and building, but in order for them to take it to the next level in the future, I'd want to see a fully co-op campaign. That being said, I think both Dragon Quest Builders titles are great little Minecraft-inspired alternatives. Not quite clones, because there's elements here that pull from all over the place. It's unmistakably Dragon Quest, and while that seems to be met with a meh kind of reaction in the West, you can't tell me this Super Saiyan Gohan looking ass main character doesn't have charm. So, anyways, when's Minecraft 2? So there you have it, the forgotten and still growing world of Minecraft clones. Now there are so many of these that I didn't tackle because a lot of them are very similar. So I tried to keep it brief, but if there are some things that you think I missed that are worth talking about, let me know down in the comments. You know the shtick. It seems like a lot of these, especially things leading into the survival crafting genre, are kind of flavor of the week and that's okay because not everything needs to be a forever game. Sometimes you want to go really hard on Valheim for a couple weeks and then just step away. If y'all liked the video, check out today's sponsor or one of the many links down below. We actually just hit 250,000 subscribers, which is a ridiculous amount of people, and I am eternally grateful, like actually. Support with like Patreon, YouTube memberships, or buying t-shirts goes a long way, but also just being here and watching me is uh, more than anyone could ask for. Thank you so much. Anyways, I've been Austin, and I'm gonna step outside because I feel like I can only see in three-dimensional cubes. So catch me next time when we talk about something a bit more rounded. Thank you so much for watching. Special Patreon shout out to Aaron Quolek, Blackfoot Ferret, Blake Thomas, Cheeks, Chris Shelton, Doug Prince, DX Buster, David Molnar, Elijah, GM Pinks, Hey Quiggles, Jay Roos, Jacoby Fitzpatrick, Kevin Zanowski, Karen Arder, Nick Irving, Ryan Talbert, and Vox. Thank you so much for your generous support. When, you know, when I started this channel, the idea of doing a Minecraft clones video was not something I had thought of, but you know, here we are, and <laughs> there's enough for a full video, so I hope you enjoyed it. I'm gonna have a lot of things coming out in May, so stay tuned for that. Should have something next week. I've been a little busy with some real stuff, but I will be opening up the Discord for public usage soon in a limited format. You guys will see what I'm talking about. I'd say look at my Twitter, but now I have zero searchability because it's pay to win, and I won't. Anyways, I'll catch you guys next time. Bye-bye.